Well, Brother Chris said uh, earlier that there were 14 spiritual decisions for Christ today to God be the glory. It's fun giving God glory, isn't it? There's nothing that causes him to shout like when a sinner report, uh, repents of their sin, surrenders their heart and their life to Christ. In fact, it's been well said that uh, Mark 8, 36, the scripture says that what shall profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? If you want to know how valuable you are to God, all you have to do is go to the cross. You're so valuable to God that He allowed His only Son, Christ Jesus, to die on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago so that we could all escape hell and go to heaven. In fact, if we can take all the money in the world and place all the wealth on this side of the platform, and then take one lost soul from Gwinnett County, Georgia, place that lost soul on this side of the platform, <coughs> and then turn and ask King Jesus, Jesus, would you please tell us what is more dear to your heart? What means more to you, Jesus? All the money in the world or this one lost soul? What do you think Christ would say? He would say that one soul means more to me than all the money in the world. You know what my prayer is for this great church? My prayer is that you will never lose the value of a soul from whom Jesus died. And then the scripture tells us over in Luke chapter 15, verses 7 and 10, as I just mentioned, how all of heaven rejoices when just one sinner repents of their sin. More so, the scripture teaches, more so than 99 just persons who need no, who need no repentance. You know what that means in layman terms? All of heaven gets more excited when a young man or a young lady or an adult man or an adult lady commits their life to Christ more so than sin. 99 people get together on Monday morning for Bible study. And I'm all for Bible studies. You heard me this morning if you were here. After I got saved, I started going to 3 a.m. Bible studies on Wednesday mornings. I'm all for Bible study. In fact, Steve Gaines, you know Steve Gaines there at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. He was the camp pastor at our camp years ago down here in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And uh, we had about 500 campers, teenagers and adult leaders at this camp. He asked the question, how many of you in this audience, you've read through the entire Bible, from Genesis to Revelation? He said, I want you to stand to your feet. 500 campers, teenagers and adult leaders. Anybody want to take a guess how many stood up in that audience? Two, less than five. Five hundred people at a camp, teenagers and adult youth workers. The question was asked by Dr. Steve Gaines, the past president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He asked the question, how many of you have read the entire Bible stand up? The founder of the camp couldn't stand it. And Chris, God, the Spirit of God convicted my heart that day. And challenged me to start reading the Bible every day and read through the Bible every year. That charge and that challenge by Steve Gaines was about 18 years ago. And for the last 18 years, I read through the Bible every year. And I read the Bible every day. But I'm here to tell this great audience, Bible reading and Bible study doesn't cause heaven to shout. The only thing that causes heaven to shout is when a sinner repents of their sin and places their faith and trust in Almighty God. So my, my prayer again for this great church is not only don't lose the value of a soul from whom Jesus died, but don't lose the victory that's involved in winning people to Jesus. And then let me just give you one final charge before I get into my text. The scripture says in the book of Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. And my prayer for this great fellowship is that you will never lose the vision of reaching this community, this state, this nation, and this world for Christ. And I think I challenged all of you this morning 
you ought to operate. Your mentality ought to be, if we don't reach this community for Christ, if we don't reach the schools in this area for Christ, if, 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 if we don't reach this county for Christ, what church in Gwinnett County is going to do? That ought to be our mindset. I've never seen an empty pew get saved. Have you ever seen an empty pew get saved? I've never seen an empty chair get saved. But we need to ask God to give us a vision. A large vision. My mentor, one of my mentors, is in heaven tonight. His name is Jerry Falwell. And God gave him a vision. In fact, God gave him several visions. One of his visions was to build a world-class Christian university. He always said, this Christian ought to be better. And today, Liberty University is the largest Christian university in the world. They have over 15,000 students on campus. They have nearly 100,000 students online. Uh, they just beat University of Mass yesterday in football. I think they're now 6-3. and three. It was always Dr. Falwell's dream. One day, he said, I may be in a wheelchair, but one day, we're going to play Notre Dame, and we're going to beat them. <laughs> And he said what, what Notre Dame is to the Catholic kid and what BYU is to the Mormon kid, liberty will be to the evangelical kid. What a vision he had. He had an education vision. He had an education vision. In fact, you could, you could move to Lynchburg, Virginia tonight and you could put your child that's three, four, five years of age, six years of age, you can put them in preschool right now up there at the Thomas Road Baptist Church and Liberty University, and they can go from preschool all the way to a PhD. That's a, that, that's a vision. He had another vision. He had a media vision. I think it was in the 1950s. He launched the Old Time Gospel Hour. He started a, a nationwide radio ministry, a nationwide TV ministry called the Old Time Gospel Hour, and they were reaching millions across the nation, around the world, through a, through a media ministry. So he had a media ministry, and he had an education ministry in the local church ministry, Thomas Road Baptist Church. I think they've got 20, 25,000 church members. And then he had a fourth vision, and his fourth vision was what he called his salt and light vision. Many of you remember the old moral majority, the religious right. Jerry Falwell started that. So, Chris, I want to challenge you and the leadership of this great church. Man, thank you. Because we serve a big God. Amen. And remember the scripture says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And by the way, when we do lose the value of the soul, and when we do lose the victory that's involved in winning people to Jesus, and when we do lose that vision of reaching the world for Christ, guess who wins? The devil wins. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans. Chapter 9. Here's somebody's billfold. And somebody's iPhone, iPad. That's yours. I don't know if we have any Bulldog fans in the house tonight. Uh, when Chris told me that the worship team was from Athens, Georgia, I said, I'm one of their Bulldog fans. I married a Bulldog. My wife graduated from that little school down there in Athens in 1982. And thank God uh, for Delta Airlines. Because in 1988, we were on the same Delta flight from Cincinnati back to Atlanta. I happened to meet this beautiful blonde, blonde, blue-eyed girl who uh, was on her way back home from uh, Seattle. She was, she was on business on a business trip. She'd been to Seattle on the way back home to Atlanta. To make a long story short, because of Delta, that's how we met. It's in my book. And uh, she grew up in a little town not too far from here called uh, Connors, Georgia. Rockdale County, Bulldog, and then went to Athens. She was there with Herschel Walker, uh, Vince Dooley, all that crap. Chris, we started dating. And I told one of your men today that I got to Atlanta, Georgia because I was working and traveling with an evangelist named Bailey Smith. 
Bain had moved his headquarters from Dallas, Texas out here to Atlanta in 1988. And I was young and single, enough to keep me from moving anywhere. So I helped move the headquarters out here in January of 88. Met Lynn in, in uh, 88, I think it was June. And she'd never been around the evangelist before. And she started coming to Bailey's real evangelist conferences and then started coming to some of these stadium crusades. And we were in Pensacola, Florida, Sunday night football stadium, citywide campaign. And Bailey preached his famous sermon, Wheat and Tares. And I mean to tell you, when the invitation was given that Sunday night, my wife, we were sitting together on the front row of the football stadium. She was the first one up out of her seat and made a beeline on that stage to give her life to Christ. And of course, everybody was sitting down the end zone for counseling. And I went down to the end zone and I sat down with Lynn and I basically said, Lynn, I thought you were already saved. I thought you had told me you had given your life to Christ. She was involved in the BSU there, Georgia. She even taught a Sunday school class over here at First Baptist Congress. And you know what she told me at the end zone that Sunday night in Pensacola, Florida? She said, Rick, the only thing I can remember was when I was nine years of age, the only thing I can remember is I was baptized. That's all she could remember about her salvation. And so that night she knelt it down. She gave her life to Christ. And then she was scripturally baptized over here at Rehoboth Baptist Church in Tucker, Georgia, where Richard Lee used to be the pastor because that's where we were, we were church members. And I've often said about baptism, water cannot save you. If water could save you, I'd get a fire hole with us for everybody to have. But water cannot save you. In fact, I gave Chris a, 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 a audio CD today from my pastor entitled Sweetwater. Because about a month ago, my pastor, James Barrett, he preached a message on baptism. You need to go online and listen to it. But I believe this much about baptism, the doctrine of baptism. I believe if a person's truly been saved, they will not have a problem getting in a tank of water to let the whole world know that you've given your life to Christ. Amen. Paul wrote the book of Romans. Paul, in 1 Timothy, said that he was the chief of all sinners. I guess that means they didn't come any back at Paul. Of course, he was heading down a dusty road one day, heading toward a town called Damascus. And as he was heading toward that town called Damascus to go and bind up believers and put them in jail and imprisonment, he had a head-on collision with God. And it was there that Paul met the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he had a conversion experience that radically changed his life. And God took a man who was known as the chief of all sinners and raised him up to be one of the great voices the world has ever known. Wrote nearly two-thirds of the New Testament. If Paul would have been a football coach, I've been told by Bible scholars, Bible scholars that Paul was a was small in stature, but he was a, he was a lion. He was a warrior for God. He was a scholar, but he was a scholar who was on fire. You put scholarship and passion together, you got dynamite, and that's what you had in Paul. And I think if Paul would have been a football coach, Chris, he would have been a great, great motivator. He would have been a great coach. I would have loved to play football for Paul. You know, we hear a lot about Barry Bryant. The older generation remembers Barry Bryant. What, what, a great, what a great leader he was. What a great coach. Now we hear about Nick Saban and all the championships. But man, can you just imagine what it would have been like playing football for Paul? Well, Paul said here in verse 1 of chapter 9 these words. Are you ready? He says in verse 1 of chapter 9, I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing the witness of the Holy Spirit. In other words, what I'm getting ready to tell you, 
the Spirit of God that dwells within my heart can vow it is truth. So I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not putting on an act. There's no pretense here. My conscience also bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. And then look at verse 2. That I have great sorrow and, what's that next word? Continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ, from my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Now I want to read those same three verses in another translation. The Living Bible says it this way. O Israel, my people, O my Jewish brothers, how I long for you to come to Christ. Did you hear that? How I long for you to come to Christ. My heart is heavy and within me and, and, and I grieve bitterly day and night. And because of you, I grieve bitterly day and night because of you. Christ knows and the Holy Spirit knows that it is no mere pretense when I say that I would be willing to be forever down if that would save you. Paul wanted his people, the Jews, to be saved. And Paul was willing to do whatever it took to see them get saved. And then look at, look, look at Romans chapter 10, the next chapter. Look at verse 1 in the next chapter. Paul said, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be... What's the next word? Say it louder. Say it louder. That's a term. Look at me, folks. That is a term that has become obsolete in many of our churches across America. And in the Living Bible Translation, Paul said it this way. Dear brothers, the longing of my heart and prayer is that the Jewish people might be saved. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. In fact, I, I, I drove on Circle Low Parkway uh, here this morning, and I'll go back the same way again tonight, but there's a Salvation Army church not too far from here. The founder of the Salvation Army was William Booth. He once said that the greatest method, <coughs> the greatest method of giving people a burden for souls would be to take them to the devil's hell <coughs> and allow them to experience what it's like to be lost in hell, separated from God for all of eternity, in the fire that should never be quenched. And then he said, I believe that men would leave with a passion, with a burden, for lost souls. And if somehow, some way, we can get on a charter bus tonight and tell that charter bus driver, take us to hell. We want to see what hell looks like. I guarantee you, look at me, folks, we wouldn't be there five minutes, we wouldn't be there five seconds until we're ready to come back to our communities and beg our friends and our neighbors and our family members and our classmates and our teammates and our co-workers to give their hearts to Christ. That was the passion that Paul had in his heart for his people to know his God. And some time ago in a publication, some of our national spiritual leaders concerning this very subject matter of our lack of passion in our churches today and in the hearts of so many believers, one of our spiritual leaders said, we have lost our focus. My prayer for this great church is, again, you will never lose the focus of richer people for God. Amen. Every, look, look at me. Every single inch of this ministry should have one focus, one aim, one goal. And that's how many people can we reach for Christ. And can I just remind us here tonight, since nobody's here but us, listen to me. The only thing that's going to matter 5,000 years from tonight is how many people do we get saved. That's all that's going to matter. Do you realize that last year in the, in, in, in the, in the largest non-Catholic denominations of the world, it's a group called Southern Baptist. They had over 11,000 of their churches last year that didn't reach one single person to Christ. Now can you explain to me tonight, can you explain to me tonight 
how a church can go 365 days, 52 weeks out of the year, and not reach one single person for Christ. Can you explain that to me? Oh, it gets worse. Last year, over 25,000 of our churches uh, did reach any teenagers. And over 35,000 didn't reach anybody between 18 and 29, you know, the college age crowd. 35,000 churches didn't reach anybody between 18 and 35. Could it be that many of our churches today across America have, have, have lost their focus? And then another great leader said it this way, I fear there's a lack of urgency in our churches. You know, you go over here to a ball game in Athens, you watch it on TV, you just see the passion, don't you? I mean, a, a grown men painting their face, adult men painting their face, getting excited about a 12-inch pigskin. But we come to church on Sunday morning and we sit here like it's a funeral. If we get excited about a pigskin, can't we get excited about Jesus? And then another great leader said it this way. He said, we're failing in evangelism. Did you hear that, church leaders? We're failing in evangelism. That means F. We're failing in evangelism. And if the tide does not turn in winning people to Christ, we will leave the next generation. I see this generation right back here. We will leave the next generation with a shipwreck. And outside of Christ, if there was ever a man who had a passion, to see people saved, it was the Apostle Paul. The man who said he was the chief of all sinners. And yet God radically saved his soul and changed his life. And God used him to turn the world upside down for Jesus. Amen. Paul said it this way in 1 Thessalonians. He said, remember, brother, our labor and our toil. Night and day we preach to you the gospel. Night and day. Here was a man who went night and day sharing the good news of Jesus. Nobody could ever point their finger at Paul and say, Paul, you never told me about Jesus. Paul, how come you never shared the gospel with me? Nobody could ever point their finger at Paul and say, you never told me about Jesus. And then a group of religious leaders in Acts chapter 20, we read that for three years, they went night and day with tears warning everyone to give their life to Christ. Can we just get transparent here tonight? When is the last time you wept over a lost soul? When is the last time tears began to swell up in your eyes and they started trickling down your face because you were so broken over somebody that you were burdened for? Chris, we were at the Second Ward Hills Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We were at a local church outreach event. Friday night, I was invited to come to a lay couple's home for a prayer meeting. I know y'all spent much time praying for this day over these last weeks and months. And I was invited to this prayer meeting inside the home of this lay couple. And you know how you come into a home and there may be three or four couples there. We understand why we're there. We're there to pray. We've got a revival. we got an outreach event, evangelistic campaign coming, and we won't really want God to move and we want God to bless this campaign. We want God to use it to revive our hearts. And we're praying that souls will be saved through this outreach. And we were having fellowship and talking and visiting. And they had some refreshments. And then we went into the living room and we got <coughs> down on our knees and we began to pray. And I learned that the couple who had opened up their home for this prayer meeting had a 19-year-old daughter who turned she had turned her back on God. She had turned her back on everything that her parents had instilled in her life. She had turned her back not only on God, but she turned her back on the church. 19 years of age, and she had moved out of the house, moved into an apartment complex with a roommate. She was living a party and lifestyle of sin there in Fort Worth, Texas. And the couple asked for us to pray for their daughter. So we began the prayer meeting on our knees in that living room. Several of the couples were praying and we all 
Sir, we're praying for the meeting that was coming up there at the Second War Hills Church. And we were praying for this little girl. And right in the middle of the prayer meeting, that little girl, 19 years of age, came inside the house, went down the hallway to her old bedroom, still trying to move some belongings into her new apartment. She was probably there less than 10 minutes. And when she walked at that front door to get in her car to drive off, that mother on her knees in the living room began to weep, she began to sob, and she began to cry. For that 19-year-old daughter, she was burdened for her dad, I mean for her daughter, to get right with God. And then the dad prayed and he began to weep and he began to sob and cry. He was broken over his 19-year-old daughter's heart. He wanted God to salvage his daughter. If you were here this morning, you heard some of my story. And I had walked in that little girl's shoes before as a preacher's kid, growing up in a Christian home and being brought up in Bible teaching churches. And when it came my time to pray, I didn't know the young lady. I just knew what the request was. And I began to weep. Didn't even know the young lady, but I had walked in those shoes before. And I began to pray for this young lady. And that night we wept and we prayed for that outreach event. We prayed for that 19 year old daughter. That was on Friday night in that living room. And on Sunday night, Sunday night at that local church, just like here tonight, Sunday night, that 19 year old girl showed up in the service. The place was packed out that Sunday night. We preached the gospel. We gave the altar call that Sunday night. And that young lady made a beeline to the altar, got down on her knees, weeping and sobbing with a broken heart. And her prayer was, Oh God, be merciful to me, sinner. And that Sunday night, that 19-year-old girl, that 19-year-old daughter, got her life right with God. And I said, no doubt about it, God heard the prayers of some people on Friday night in the living room whose hearts were broken. They were weeping and shedding tears, broken for a 19-year-old teenager to get right with God. My question is, when's the last time we have wept over lost souls? Paul went day and night. With tears, warning everyone to give their life to Christ. And then as you have studied over the years the, 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 the history of great men of God like John Knox who once said the words, Oh God, give me Scotland or I'll die. John Wesley, I just told Brother Chris, John Wesley, I understand you guys are connected with the Wesley Foundation there in Athens. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, said these words. We have only one job on earth, save souls. A chestnut family, can you think of anything that's more important and more dear to the heart of God than the, than the salvation of sinners? We have only one job on earth, save souls. And can I remind us all here tonight, God has no hand but your hands. God has no feet but your feet. God has no tongue but your tongue to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You'd be surprised how many people today sitting in pews in churches all over America, their attitude is, that's what we pay the pastor to do. This man of God has no more responsibility to win people to Jesus than you do. Do you hear me? God has called all of us to be his witnesses. He could have called angels to do his work, but he didn't. He chose you. He chose you. He chose me. He chose every one of us who have given our life to Christ. He's chosen us to be his witnesses. We are his mouthpieces. We are his messengers. We are his warriors. We are his ambassadors. Paul knew this. Then I think of the words of David Brenner, that great missionary. He said, when I wake in the morning, listen to these words, when I wake in the morning, I think of souls. Now let's just be good level honest. How many of us got up this morning at 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock, and the first thing that was on our heart was all souls? Come on, let's get honest. He said, when I wake up in the morning, I think of souls. And when I go to bed at night, I think of souls. How many of us go to bed every night in our nice, comfortable houses? And we go to bed with lost souls in our hearts and minds. He said, souls are so much on my heart. There's a pain in my chest because I think so much of souls. God, give me that kind of passion. And then A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance. In fact, there's a Christian Missionary Alliance institution up here in Tacoma, Georgia. It's called Tacoma Falls College. And the founder of that great denomination 
was found in his study one morning with his arms wrapped around the globe, weeping for the souls of men. A man who had a passion to reach the world for Christ. And then Billy Graham, one of my heroes. I had the honor to be on the platform with Dr. Graham in his Philadelphia crusade in 1992, and then we were also with him in his Pittsburgh crusade. What a giant, what a giant he was for God. Touched the world for Christ. I still think of the, of the story, how he came to know Christ. He and a couple of his buddies were in a tent revival in Charlotte, North Carolina. There was an evangelist by the name of Marty Cahill. He was preaching a tent revival right outside of Charlotte. I think they were using Billy's dad's dairy farm as the property to have this tent revival. But there were some teenagers, some teenagers sitting in the back, sitting back here in the back. They were acting up, being typical, little rebellious teenagers. And the ushers of that campaign came that close to tell those boys to leave. And Marty Cahan preached the gospel that night. And Grady Wilson, Billy Graham came forward in that altar call and gave their life to Christ. And God raised up a teenage boy out of Charlotte, North Carolina to touch the world for Christ. You just never know the impact that could be made in an outreach event, in a local church event, in a youth camp event, in a citywide campaign, in a mission, overseas mission campaign. You just never know the impact that can be made on somebody's life that will be faithful, faithful and faithful to proclaim the gospel. Billy Graham said, I believe that there's one thing that pierces the heart of God. It's not the world's sin of iniquity, but the Christian's indifference and unconcern towards a lost and dying world. That's where we're at today, church. We have become indifferent. We've lost the concern to reach this world for Jesus. The stats prove it. And then C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite writers, said it this way. The church, including Chestnut Grove, the church exists for no other purpose but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christ. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, all the clergy, all the missions, all the sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. Think of all the churches as wasting a whole lot of time. Because they have forgotten what the main thing is. And I'm here to tell this great audience, the main thing is winning people to Jesus. Can I get an amen? So many of our churches today, we're majoring on the minors and we're minoring on the majors. And Christ said that we're to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. I got saved in 1984. Two years later, I'm coaching the running backs up here at Liberty University. You heard me this morning. I thought I was going to be the next, you know, Tom Landry. I was going to be the next Barrett Bryant. I was going to be the next Apple Swinton. Man, I was climbing that coach professional ladder. I got saved in 1984 there in Lubbock, Texas, and left Texas Tech. Went to Lynchburg, Virginia, and became the running back coach at Liberty. And during those two years, coaching the running backs at Liberty University, I lost the passion and the fire and the ambition for coaching. At one time, coaching football was my God. But during those two years, Chris, God placed me in an atmosphere in Lynchburg, Virginia, in a town that Jerry Falwell basically owned and grew up as a kid, that started a worldwide evangelistic ministry up there. And then in the middle of that atmosphere, Slowly but surely, God took that passion of coaching out of my heart, and He placed the desire in my heart to serve Him full time. So in January of 1986, guess what I did? I resigned from the coaching profession. I walked into the head coach's office, turned in my resignation. We're in the middle of recruiting season. And the coach said, well, can you at least stay on through signing date? I said, yes. Jerry Falk would already give me a scholarship to go through the seminary, which I did. And I surrendered to God's call to the gospel ministry in 1986. 
I remember sitting down with Dr. Falwell. I said, Dr. Falwell, how can a young man really know for sure he's being called to preach? Well, he began to tell me about his call. And then I sat down with Sumner and went up. And I said, Brother Sumner, how can a young man really know for sure he's being called to preach? And man, we were at the Days Inn Breakfast restaurant there at the Days Inn in Lynchburg. And man, if you ever knew who Sumner Whip was, he was one of the greatest soul winners. I mean, one of the greatest soul winners you've ever heard in your life. Let me tell you about Sumner Whip. He would be sitting in a church audience. He may just be there visiting, but he's in a church audience. And if he didn't hear the pastor preach the gospel, he would go up to the pastor after the sermon and say, Pastor, you didn't preach the gospel. That's how bold Sumner Whip was. What, what do you mean I didn't preach the gospel? He said, there was nothing in your content about the death, the burial, and the resurrection. <coughs> You'd be surprised how many sermons have been preached today on television, radio, pulpits all over America, and there's no gospel content in the sermon. How can a man get saved apart from the gospel? He can't. Chris, make sure every sermon we got the gospel in. If it takes just 60 seconds, get the gospel in. So I sat down with some of the women, sat down with Edward Towns, some of those great men, Harold Wilmington. I sat down with some of those great giants of God up there. And my question was, how can you really know for sure you're being called to preach? And then I flew to, Lynch, uh, to Dallas, Fort Worth, where my mom and dad lived in Euless, Texas. They were members there, First Baptist, Euless. Dr. Jimmy Draper, right around the corner from Mom and Dad's house there, Eulis was a great man of God. Some of you may know the name. Manly Beasley. Evangelist Manly Beasley. Anybody remember the name Manly Beasley? A few of you? Manly was like a second dad to me. And I went to Manly's house one, one day. I was getting ready to go to the airport to fly down to New Orleans for the National Coaches Convention back in January of 86. This is back when Barry Switch was still the head coach at Oklahoma, so that tells you how far back it was. I sat down with Manly Beach and I said, Manly, how can a young man really know for sure he's being called to preach? And Manly Beach said these words. He said, Rick, if God's calling you to preach, you'll be miserable doing anything else. And how right he was. I went to DFW and on a plane, flew to New Orleans. I'm there at the National Coaches Convention. Every January, it's like our every June is the Southern Baptist Convention, but every January is the National Football Coaches Association Convention. And there's all these big dog, all these big dog coaches. Tom Osborne, Barry Switzer, Jimmy Johnson, all these great coaches. And I didn't want to go to the clinics to learn more about X's and O's or how to be a better coach. I just wanted to be with God. So I go to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes Bible studies at night. I go to the FCA Bible studies. And I left that convention early and flew back to Lynchburg, Virginia. The devil's throwing every dart he could in my mind. Why I should not get out of coaching? Why I should not surrender to God's call to the ministry? Well, how are you going to pay your, your bills? How are you going to pay your partner rent? How are you going to pay your car note? Isn't that the way the devil works? And on my knees in my apartment there in Lynchburg, Virginia, God spoke to me loudly and clearly and said, Rick, I've already called you, son. I'm waiting on you to take that step of faith. And the following Monday morning is when I walked into the head coach's office and turned in a resignation. That was in January of 86. You do the math. And since 86, I've been traveling all over the world trying to do all that we can to help advance the kingdom of God. <clears throat> I'm here to tell this great church that it's fun giving God glory. You heard me this morning. I got saved at a local church in Lubbock, Texas on Sunday night. And the evangelist was James Robinson. I don't know, maybe a couple months after I got saved, he was having a conference in Dallas, Texas, Civic Center. And there was a man preaching on that conference by the name of Arthur Blessed. A man who has carried, this to me guys, a man who has carried a cross on his back. Now, 
He's got a wheel back there. But he's carried a cross on every continent in the world. One man has carried a cross on every continent in the world. Author Blessing. Google Author Blessing when you get home. One of, the, one of the most powerful men of God I've ever been exposed to in my life. One of the greatest soul winners I've ever met in my life. You talk about a man, we, we talk about Paul's boldness, Paul's passion. If there was ever a man that was close to the Apostle Paul was all the blessing. And he preached on that conference, the Dallas Convention Center, on being a difference maker, on being a personal evangelist, a personal witness, a soul winner for Christ. However you want to phrase it, he got my attention. And he gave an altar call. Now, normally at Bible conferences, 99.9%, you assume everybody there knows the Lord. Pastors, staff members, lay leaders. It's a Bible conference. He gave an altar call. And his altar call, his appeal was, if you want to commit your life to become a personal soul winner, I want you to get up out of your seat and I want you to come to the altar. He said, I'm going to pray for you. I got up out of my seat and came to the altar. And I told God that day, make me a soul winner. I want to be a fisherman. I want to be a difference maker. I want to point people to Jesus. I told God that day at the altar, make me a soul winner. Everybody say it together. Make me a soul winner. Say it again. Make me a soul winner. That's what I told God. And there were about 500 that, that, that responded to that appeal. And then all their blessings said, if, if you want to go out witnessing with me this afternoon, meet up here at the Coliseum, we're going to pray, we're going to get our gospel ammunition, we call them gospel tracks. Do they still do gospel tracks on the campus there in Athens? <laughs> and we're going to go out witnessing. And so we showed up that afternoon, a bunch of people. We prayed. We got, we got our gospel ammunition. Author led the charge. Carried his cross down the streets of downtown Dallas. You don't try this sometime, Chris. Grace Grace the community. Let's get him across. He's got a little wheel on the back. And all the chestnut grove folks, we're going to just follow right behind him. And we're going to spend a couple hours here at Grayson, passing out gospel tracts, going door to door. Tell me about Jesus. And that's what we did the day in downtown Dallas. And this old preacher's kid, I've never laid about Jesus before. I've just been saved, you know, just a few weeks. But I just told God that morning to make me a what? Make me a what? So what? So here we are down the streets of downtown Dallas. A young man was at a bus stop. I mean, he would just sit there like you, waiting to catch a bus. And I went up to the young man. I said, friend, can I ask you a question? He said, go ahead. I said, do you know for certain if you died today, if you'd go to heaven? He said, no, I don't know that. Well, that became music to my ears. And I sat down on that bench with that young man, opened up my little New Testament, and I walked him through the plan of salvation. Took him over Romans 3, 23. Took him over Romans 6, 23. Romans 5, 8. Romans 10, 9. Romans 10, 13. That's about all the scriptures I knew back then. And I got through sharing with him the scriptures. And I shared a little bit about how I got saved recently. And then I said, Would you be willing today to invite Christ to come into your life? He said, I certainly would. And Chris, right there at that bus stop, before that bus ever showed up, that young man bowed his heart and invited Christ into his life. Now, you know what that did for me? That set my soul on fire. I mean, I just led my first soul to Jesus in Dallas, Texas, at a bus stop. I just led my first soul to Jesus. Look at me, folks. I never got no. I just heard a stat here in just the last couple weeks how some 90 
95, maybe a little higher than 95, but some 95% of our church members have never led a soul to Jesus. Can you imagine going all through life here on earth as a born again believer? You've been on this journey of faith for 10, 20, 30, 50, 60 years and standing before God one day at, 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 at the, at the beam of seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ for the believers. Standing before Jesus one day in the end. We need a passion. Nobody loves football better than more than me. Mark Rick wrote the forward of my boat. Mark and I stay in touch on a regular basis. Of course, he just had a heart attack. He's doing great. I believe Mark will be doing a lot of ministry work in the days ahead. Because he's got a heart for God. But I love, I love, I love athletics, I love sports, I love football. Man, if somehow, some way we could take that passion that we have in Athens or we go to Tuscaloosa, or, you know, you go to the Falcons game, I don't know about the Falcons, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Kansas City Chiefs, Dallas Cowboys, but you, the passion, the passion that we have for sports, if we could just somehow translate some of that, just a fracture of some of that passion into the house of God and for the, the for the kingdom of God, think of the impact we can make in this world overnight. God, give us a passion to win the world for Jesus. And that was Paul's desire. He wants to see people saved. And he said in verse 3, Romans 9, that he wants to see his people saved so bad that if it could be possible, he would be willing to go to hell if it would cause his friends to go to hell. Now, Christian can't go to hell. But what Paul was willing to do, but couldn't, Jesus did. So that we to escape hell and go to heaven. There was a young man tonight in Charlotte, North Carolina. Chris had came to go tell camp many years ago. Got saved. 16 years of age, he got saved. Down at the altar, he been there. Gave his life to Christ at the altar. Got on a church, church bus. Friday, went back to a lost dad, a lost mother, and a lost sister. And he went back with such a fire in his heart, he wanted his, his whole family to be saved. And God used that young man to lead his mother to Jesus and lead his sister to Jesus. 16 years old. And his daddy was a hard case. And I had the honor, Chris, to preach in the young man's church that fall season after that camp season. And they, that young man's father was sitting right back in the back with his family. The wife, the young man, the sister, they're all together. And I preached that Sunday morning, gave the altar call. And that daddy got up out of his seat. He came down the altar and on his knees, I mean a grown man down on his knees, giving his life to Christ. And here was the wife that was huddled over her husband. Here was the son who had been begging God to save his dad. Here was the daughter that the son had led to Christ. I mean, the whole family was huddled over the daddy. And that whole family, look at me folks, the whole family tonight in Charlotte, North Carolina is complete in Christ because a 16-year-old teenager got right with God at a youth camp, went back home and became a missionary to his own family. You know what the pastor of that local church tells me about that young man's dad? He said, Rick, he's the most dedicated, one of the most committed men in our local church. It stuck. 
So my prayer is, before we walk out of this room tonight, that we will renew our vows, that we will recommit our hearts back to God to be the soul winners that God has called us to be. Why? Because he has no hands but your hands. He has no feet but your feet. He has no tongue but your tongue. To share the most precious gift one can ever know. And his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Every head bowed right close. We've